So, hello, my name is Michael Starch. I am, well, what James said, a data engineer at JPL. Technically, I'm a computer engineer in applications, but my application is big data research. So, I kind of claim the title for myself of data engineer. Today, we'll be going in, uh, talking a little bit about big data, and then some of the work we've done at JPL that has been open sourced uh, to help people, anyone, process big data. So, without further ado, let's begin. Our basic agenda is we're going to talk a little bit about data processing, then we're going to jump into what are data systems, why are they used, and what do they do. Then we're going to drop through the original data system that we developed at JPL called Apache OODT. And then we'll talk about Apache Spark, which is the new revolutionary technology in the big data world. We'll talk about the combination of those two Apache technologies. We'll run through an example, and then I will convince you that you want to join our open source project and help out. So, uh, let's begin. Data processing. So, the basic idea behind data processing is you have information that you want to run some transformation on, and that will yield some other information. Pretty simple. As you get more complicated, you start running other bits of information together through a transformation to produce a new set of information. This is basically what data processing is. This is what we do in the scientific community at JPL. We have data sets, say that from a satellite. We run it through some form of transformation, generally a really nasty inverse differential equation, and then we get information out the backside. And we as computer scientists work on neural networking code or anything else that makes that transformation run efficiently. But what a data engineer does is says, how can we make this whole process more efficient? So that brings in the idea of parallelization. If your data is relatively independent, and I know the colors are kind of washed out, but these two bits of information are different colors than these, showing to my audience here that they're independent sets of data. So you can draw a line between them and process them at the same time. We've been doing this as computer scientists for a very long time. It's called parallel processing. And that's kind of an idea we should keep uh, with us as we move through the rest of, of this talk. So what is big data? Big data is just what it sounds like. It's a giant blob of information that has to go through a very narrow pipe called the transformation and come out as another giant blob of data. This is relatively unfortunate when you have petabytes or more of data that you want to run through some very slow transformations. That is the heart of big data. How do we move? How do we process? How do we transform? large data sets. And one idea that's coming onto the scene right now is, hey, maybe you can take this large data set and chop it into many, many, many tiny data sets that are effectively independent. Imagine a customer list of 20 billion customers, each with name and phone number. Well, you can chop that list up as much as you want because my name and my phone number is an independent piece of information. My name is independent on James' name. So as you can see here, if this were our customer list, you'd have customer, 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 and each of these blocks would represent one record, customer and their phone number. That's what we mean by independent data, that the data does not depend on other data in other boxes. So let's talk about data systems. The whole idea behind a data system is we want to effectively handle all of this data that we want to process and make sure it's organized and repeatable. So that's very difficult to do if you just have a slew of data sitting out there and you're running a bash script that sits there and processes one result and then you type in the name of that result and then you repeat it a hundred billion times. That's prone with operator error and it's very difficult and tedious. So we came up with the idea of a data system to help us manage this whole process of reading in data, keeping track of where your data is, and writing data out the other side. So, the first thing we should know about data systems is they help us archive, query, and search through that data. This is what your data would look like without a data system. Just a lot of really strange blocks. And I'm asking, where's Waldo? Well, of course, Waldo is the red and white striped block, but it's very difficult to see right here. And if it weren't so for our human faculties of really good image processing, it would take us a while to identify that block. 
However, when you organize that data in a regimented way, it's very easy to find the block we're looking for. This is what data systems do. They help you organize all of that data that you've got floating around your disks so that it's quickly accessible, you can query it, and you can search through it. The next step that it does is basically resource management and scheduling. Long ago, we had batch processing systems where every computer scientist wanted to go in and run their code, and they put all the code in a batch. Data systems took that idea and said, well, we can apply that same idea to data. See, what you get is queues, that is, your batch processing, and the algorithms that run on the queues sit and wait until a node has space. So as you can see here, our nodes over here are full, so these jobs are sitting here waiting to process. This is the basic data system. It says I have this many nodes, I have to keep track of what can process where so that your system is ordered and you don't just try to process everything at once and watch the computer crash. So processing, scheduling, and resource management are a fundamental piece of data systems. They have to take your resources and make sure they're properly scheduled so your jobs come through in the order that you like and that you don't destroy any of your computers in the attempt to do so. And then finally, the last piece of data systems that we'll talk about today is getting data and pushing data out to the people you want to have your data. So we call that ingest and delivery. As you can see, ingest is bringing data in from an external source into your system, and delivery is pushing it back out again. This is fundamental because if your data system can't get data from other people and you can't push your data out to those who want it, it's a very useless data system. It just sits there and says, I can process stuff, but nobody knows what I'm doing. At JPL, we have to do this every day because we're part of the greater NASA community. So we're getting data from all over NASA that we have to pull in, and scientists all over the world want to get the data that we produce. So sometimes we push that to a web archive, sometimes we push that to a website, but the fundamental principle is bringing data in and pushing data back out again. All right, so this brings us to a discussion of Apache OODT. Apache OODT is a data system that was developed at NASA and sent to the Apache Software Foundation who solved just this problem. It helps you keep track of where your data is, keep track of the metadata on that data so you can search and query for your data. It has resource management capabilities so you can process that data effectively on a cluster and it makes sure that you're able to get the pieces of data that you want externally and provide delivery for the pieces that you have inside your data system that customers are looking for. So this is the basic Apache ODT system. To start with, we have the file manager here. The file manager here has one task. It makes sure that your data in the form of files are managed. So it has a Lucene backend, and the Lucene backend keeps track of your metadata so that you can query and search through that data. We've also hooked it up with an, uh, a solar, an Apache solar uh, web interface, so you can query through that Lucene catalog effectively. It also makes sure that your files are stored on NFS or on the file system so that it keeps track of the physical data that you have along with the metadata. Then it also has a basic resource management capability which takes care of the nodes that you see down here. It manages the nodes for you. The style it's using is the same old batch system where you have a little program runs that says I have this much space, give me a job, give me a job, give me a job, up, oh, I'm out of space, wait till I finish and then you can give me more. It's a very simple resource management scheme but it is effective on small clusters. <clears throat> Then we have ingestion, which comes from the push-pull and the crawler, which helps you get data in and push data out to the people who want your data. The one thing that uh, the o Apache ODT system adds to what we've talked about so far is a workflow manager. The idea of a workflow is simple. You want to process something, and then something else, and then something else, kind of in a pipeline. So if you have three independent applications that all run on data, one, two, three, the workflow manager keeps track of that orchestration so that your stuff processes in the correct order. This is the data system as it was shipped to Apache and as it is being used across the open source community. It's got many followers and it is used at NASA and several other research institutions. It is very good for what it does. but. Let's, let's dive a little deeper into this diagram and start to see where we see problems. Anybody notice a problem right off the bat? Anyone? 
How about this? Is there a problem with NFS? Yes. So, like James said, yes, there's a problem with NFS. NFS is a network file system hosted on a single computer, and so it becomes a bottleneck. And as soon as your read and writes uh, take up the entire network pipe of that host hosting your disks, you can't move any more data. So if you're trying to move petabytes at a time for processing, NFS is a huge bottleneck. Another problematic thing is file systems in general. They tend to conk out on you every once in a while. You lose a disk, you lose redundancy. We did the calculations on a, one of our projects and said, if we lose more than two disks in our RAID unit, the RAID unit will crash and it will take us one year of data recovery to recover. We had backups, but we only had a single tape spindle to read those backups. So the calculation was that we would be down for a year. That's not good when you're an active mission. So our essays got on it and they fixed the problem, but it's inherently limiting to depend directly on the data system. Another, another limiting factor are these nodes over here. We just said that they were a standard batch processing system. Now, standard batch processing systems, in general, aren't very good at a concept called multi-tenancy. Multi-tenancy is the idea that you run both your batch system and a couple of web servers on, on your machine. But everything you run on that machine thinks it owns the whole thing, so pretty soon you have a zoo where everything is eating everything else until the machine crashes. Because they don't play nicely as good tenants, they think they own the whole property and they abuse it. So those nodes are probably not well managed and probably incapable of running things that also require the node distributed architecture. These are the things that are popping up all over the place. Hadoop, Kafka, all of these technologies use nodes, but none of those technologies like to play nicely together. So that's some of the uh, limitations of this design. And as you can see, if we try to crank a ton of data through this design, we're going to see obvious bottlenecks where we have problems. So, we have to investigate new technologies to keep up with the modern world. That brings in Apache Spark. So Apache Spark is MapReduce technology. Now, how many of you have heard of MapReduce before? Great. How many of you can give a dissertation on this? Good. All right, so I'll attempt to give a very brief introduction to MapReduce processing. MapReduce processing was popularized by the Hadoop system designed at Yahoo. The idea is you take your giant chunk of data, break it into those parallel bits that we saw earlier, run those parallel bits on separate nodes. When the data comes out the other side, you reduce it back into a giant block. So it's like you've processed the whole block, but you're capable of basically scaling these parallel streams to any number you need to effectively process quickly. Now, Hadoop had one problem. Hadoop was based on disk I.O. So every calculation it did, it would read in the data, calculate, and then write back out the data onto disk. Now, no matter how fast and how efficient you get your disks and your cache in your Hadoop system, that's still going to be slow compared to what we used to use, which was called memory, where you did all of your reading and writing to RAM. RAM is inherently faster. And until they figure out how to get a large petabyte disk within nanometers of your processing unit on your CPU, you're going to be in trouble. Intel's announced it for 2017. Yeah, so they're going to put me out of a job, but we'll wait two years to see if that'll pan out. Because they've also announced a fusion reactor in, what, 15 years? So we'll see. So anyway, disk IOs are intense. We want to keep stuff in memory, if at all possible. That was the brilliance behind the Apache Spark MapReduce technique. They said, let's just keep everything in memory and just write backups out to disk so that all of your processing is in memory. It has the speed of memory, the efficiency of memory, and that memory will be treated, distributed across the system just like MapReduce takes your disks and pretends they're available across the entire cluster. So, enter the Berkeley Data Analysis stack. The Berkeley Data Analysis stack was designed to create just this system in memory MapReduce processing. However, they put in some other pieces to make it more efficient. So first of all, there's your standard Hadoop file system. The Hadoop file system spreads out across the entire cluster and gets rid of that file system bottleneck we saw earlier by replicating your data and using the entire cluster's local disks to store your data. 
That way, if a machine goes down, you don't lose data, and you're not dependent on raids in a central location. Tachyon is an addition they made to that, which pushes that whole file system up into memory and backs it up to the Hadoop file system. That way, all of your files are in memory at all times, if you have enough RAM on your systems. And if your systems go down, hey, Hadoop is still there storing your stuff to local disk. So that's a great setup. Then we have Spark, which does the MapReduce processing in memory, and thus keeps your processing very efficient. And we have a whole bunch of libraries that use Spark to do other things you might want to do. For example, GraphX is graph computations. And my favorite is Spark Streaming, which does streaming data computations. These are all built on the Spark engine. Yeah, did you have a question? Can you say, I, I, mean, I just lost the, the focus. Can you say again about Mesos? Oh, I haven't gotten to Mesos yet. Sorry. Okay. That's OK. So he introduces us into our next topic. Mesos is a very key feature of this entire stack. Remember when we were talking about all those things trying to run on a cluster and fighting with one another until the machine crashed? Mesos handles that. Mesos says, OK, I'm going to be the apartment complex manager of your machine and make sure that everybody is given the resources it needs to run. So Mesos says, I'm going to do cluster management, and I'm going to enforce multi-tenancy by telling your daemons that run on your cluster, you have this much resources to use, and this other guy has these other resources to use, and in this way, your machine is never overloaded. Did that answer your question? Yes. But if I may, can I ask? Sure. So does this mean, so am I running both Hadoop uh, or Spark and something else on the same node and Mesos tells them you use this much or in general, global view of the test? <coughs> so Mesos actually runs in this way. It has a centralized cluster manager that uh, I believe it talks to Zookeeper so it can have multiple uh, instantiations if you crash the head node. And then it has clients on each of your uh, computing nodes. And the clients say, we're just going to read how much free memory and uh, free, mu free disk and free network there is and report that to the, the head guy. The head guy then takes requests from everyone else, say a Kafka installation, a Spark installation, your Hadoop HDFS installation. It takes those requests and says, Okay, I'm going to grant you this many resources out of what has been reported to me. You can use those. I'm going to take this other rep report of resources and say you can use those. And so it takes all of the resources that its, uh, its uh, clients are reporting and distributes them in, uh, across all of the things trying to use resources. That way you don't overuse your nodes. Go ahead. Are those timed leases? Are those timed leases? Does it allocate that amount to the process until it gets a response back from the process? Or is it given to the process for so, a defined chunk of time? So the process is required to define uh, an API that works with Mesos. And the API works basically like, here is your offer. If you do not accept that offer, I'm going to take it back and give it to someone else. So Mesos reserves the right to not uh, to when your API call says, I want to accept those resources, Mesos reserves the right to say, no, they're no longer available. So that your application can't sit there for three hours and then say, oh, I wanted that, those resources. How so, does it handle applications dying or not reporting back in when they're done? How does it handle applications dying or not reporting back So some applications check so, out the resources. Right. So when the API comes down, there is an error reporting mechanism built into the API that reports whether or not one of these API pieces is crashed. And keep in mind that your clients are also actively monitoring the nodes to see if the resources are, are available or not. Now, beyond that, I can't tell you more detail because that's getting into some serious underlying engineering behind Mesos. Uh, they have very good documentation on the internet, and it is an open source project. So you're welcome to um, look there or talk to me afterwards if you have more questions. Anything else on this topic? Okay, so what you're left with here is a multi-tenancy managed stack that allows you to do MapReduce processing in memory with all of the conveniences of having your data stored on disk. That is, if pieces start crashing, you don't lose data because it's in a non-volatile storage. So, whoops, I went the wrong way, sorry. 
So, that brings us to the Apache Spark slide. Apache Spark operates like this. It takes that transformation on the data that we were talking about earlier and the information that you're trying to process and wraps it up in a resilient distributed data set. That resilient distributed data set is shipped out to all the nodes with certain pieces going to some node and this is how you get your parallelization. You have your transformation and your data baked in and your data is parceled up between all the nodes they crank through it, and then when everything is finished, it's reduced back together. Also, we've mentioned once before, but just so you can see them, there are four major libraries that run on the top of Apache Spark that allow you to do more complex things without writing the code yourself. Spark SQL handles uh, your cluster and says you're going to be a metadata store as well, which is nice, so you don't have to have a separate metadata store. You have Spark Streaming, which allows you to handle streaming data types, say a TCP connection that's connected to some sensor and just constantly reporting data. Spark allows you to handle that by saying, okay, we're going to treat this like normal Spark processing by chopping the stream up into RDDs, and then each RDD is processed like normal, and then at the end we combine the RDDs back into a stream, if that's what you'd like. It has MLIP, which is machine learning, and GraphX, which we've talked about already, graph computations. All of this becomes a very powerful system for MapReduced. Go ahead. Is MLIP like similar to Mahout? Say that again? Is MLIP similar to Mahout or Mahout? It's another machine learning. Uh, I would guess so. Yeah. I would say this is probably the equivalent in Spark, although I have not heard of that. But based on the name, it sounds like something written for Hadoop, yes. and this is the in-memory version. So I know they have things like neural networks and all of that, but I'm not so deep into machine learning yet, so I can't tell you exactly what's in it. Any other questions? All right. So, whoops, still going the wrong way. So this brings us to the major topic of today's discussion, which is streaming OODT. So the streaming ODT was designed to take these two ideas of really powerful cluster management and processing and a data system and combine them together so that users could quickly check out and run this stuff. So this looks kind of like our old ODT system with some augmentations. First of all, we have a stream ingest piece. This is important because one of the key principles behind streaming ODT is handling streaming data types. So the first thing I told you about ODT is it uses the file paradigm. It keeps its files on disk. Files are not the wave of the future. Streams of data are the wave of the future. Files take too long to partition up. They take too long to read and write. People are becoming much more uh, capable of handling streaming data. And so we wanted to bake that in from the ground layer so that you could process streaming data just as easily as you always process stuff based in files. So, we have a stream ingest. The next piece is the Spark SQL layer. The Spark SQL layer is basically saying we had a Lucene catalog. It worked fine, but hey, if you've already got Spark running on your cluster, why not put your metadata there too to simplify the number of technologies? This has not yet been implemented in the Apache version of streaming ODT because, like I said, the Lucene catalog works just fine, so this is slated to be produced. We have a standard workflow manager so you can start doing workflows of streams. So when you start getting stream outputs, you can start mutting those stream outputs directly into the rest of your workflow. Then we have your resource manager which has the Spark backend and the Mesos backend. This allows the resource manager to manage your Spark cluster and be tied into Mesos. This is key because, at least in my field, people aren't ready to abandon files and run right to streaming and just be there. They want to process the old way and just kind of dip their foot in the pond. That's how we work. So, we need a Mesos backend that says the old way of doing batch processing is now multi-tenancy enabled, right? That's the backwards compatibility layer, so you haven't lost the ability to do anything you've done before. Then the Spark layer says, hey, if you want this great technology that allows you to crank through data, it's sitting there too, ready to go. Then we have our processing cluster. The processing cluster is no longer a series of nodes, but it's represented by one generic box. That's because Spark and Mesos and all of these other cluster technologies say, we don't really care how many nodes you have. You can dynamically add nodes, dynamically shut down nodes. They're treated as a one giant processing block, even if it's 10,000 different machines. 
So that is the basic streaming OODT system. It should be noted, however, what we have down here at the bottom of placing NFS. So this is part of the design. We have your file system at the very bottom. This is local disks on all of your machines. Eventually, everything has to be stored in a file system to prevent uh, data loss. However, running on top of that, we have Hadoop and Tachyon. This is like we said earlier for the Berkeley Data Analysis Stack. We're now using that as part of this setup so that you will get built-in speed and redundancy. And then the other important piece is Kafka. Kafka is an open source streaming engine and it was originally designed to handle streams of log files. But they wrote it in such a way that any stream can be stored inside Kafka. So Kafka is our streaming data manager. Whereas the file manager just used to write files to disk, suddenly we have to capture these streams of data and hold on to them for a little while before we evict them and say this data is too old. Kafka was designed for exactly that purpose, so we are using to it to catch our streaming data. So, streaming data comes in, metadata goes over here to the catalog so you can search find, query for streams, and the actual data goes into Kafka where it sets for a user-defined length of time, and then Kafka says, you're taking up too much disk, I'm going to start evicting old uh, bytes of data, allowing new bytes of data to come in without blowing up your computer. So this is the streaming ODT design. Go ahead. So are those metadata also the Hadoop metadata, or this is at the higher level in Hadoop, so not so the file system? This is actually OODT metadata. OODT metadata is defined by the user per product type so that the user can query and search through their data as they see fit. So the goal here is to just give you that same functionality that always existed inside OODT for use with streams, Spark data, or normal files. It's all stored in the same way. The only difference between the old style file metadata and the new stream metadata is the type field. One says it's a stream, the other says it's a file. But they're treated the same way, so that you have access to your data in a very easy to understand interface. And you don't have to learn new technologies to handle streams. It's baked in to the same data system that has always been providing you with a simple interface. Does that answer your question? Go ahead. So when you have a stream, this, uh, I may not be understanding fully, but say I have a weather satellite and it's streaming down images, I guess I want to process them in real time and get the products out the other end. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the example. Um, what happens if there's a failure in one of my processing centers? Uh, do I get to restream that data through this whole system, or is there some other way of dealing with it? So your question is, what happens if there is a failure in one of the processing centers? So the data system here doesn't tell you how to handle your failures. All it does is provide the raw mechanics of how to uh, keep track of your data and process your data. So it depends on the use case, right? For example, the big use case we're hoping to get this involved in is radio astronomy because they produce petabytes of data terabytes a second, and they only want to look at a very small amount. So you bring in a stream of that data, you filter for interesting science, and then you evict everything that's not interesting, and the interesting stuff gets forked down into a file for scientists to look at later. If there's a failure in there, remember Kafka is designed so that it holds onto your data for a certain amount of time. So you would define a failure window that it holds onto your data for, and then you would restart processing, which would start wherever the stream starts, and read forward from that point. So if you experienced a failure, you would start a new stream of processing and run through whatever was left in Kafka to recover from that failure. That's one possible solution. That's not the only solution. Another possible solution is just to say, with this much data, we probably don't care about failures. That's a very real possibility in a lot of applications. Science data and maybe medical data, not so much, but a lot of people, oh, there's a failure. Okay, we didn't process our Facebook click stream today. That's okay, we'll put up some ads, whatever it is, and move on. So with your specific example, weather satellites, generally you process once and throw away the data. So if there's a failure, they just say, okay, slightly inaccurate weather forecasts for the next half an hour, and then we have more data. So it just depends on your application, but there's nothing here to prevent you from starting over as long as you've set your eviction window in Kafka long enough that your data hasn't been lost to the cosmos. That actually happened recently. <laughs> what? The weather satellite data <clears throat> being down for like a yeah. day or two. And it affected weather forecasts for, you know, 
Yeah. But again, it's weather forecast for like a week at most, right? And after a week, the weather meteorologists are back to normal data. So that's kind of different from looking at it from a climatology study where you want every piece of data for you know, 10 years and it all has to be there. So it really depends on your application. Uh, Go ahead. I thought there was data redundancy with the tachyon having... Right, all of these pieces produce data redundancy. So if one of your system goes down, you're unlikely to lose that data. The question is, how do you recover? Do you care about figuring out where in your Kafka stream you are we were when you failed and try to run through that again? Or do you just want to keep processing the latest data because you really care about real-time results? It's all up to the user. And none of these things say you have to do it one way or the other. Does that make sense? Answer your question? Is Kafka data streamer or is it the file system, in-memory file system? Uh, so, in-memory file system is Tachyon. Kafka says, all right, I'm going to receive streaming data, allow the pool to fill up, and when the pool fills up to the top, data starts spilling over the edge. So you get to keep newest data, and as data ages, eventually it gets too old and is pushed out. It's just a temporary reserve for data, because if you saved every stream to disk, for some streams, that could take up a lot of disk space. Go ahead. Is Kafka evicting from its own buffers, or does it say that yeah. copy on the RPU or a file system? I believe it uses these other pieces to store its data. I would have to look that one up for you. But it, it does manage its own data, so it's evicting from itself. How it actually persists that data to disk, I do not have an answer for you at this exact time. Uh, any other questions? All right. So, oh, I went backwards again. All right, so now we're going to talk about the example I had. And it demonstrates this technology. Most importantly, it demonstrates how easy it is to set up and use. So, some background. The example we're running here is running on a four node cluster at JPL. And it was set up by running a script and letting the script run to the end. Set, I think it was something like six configuration parameters. This is your temp space. This is where your software is installed. And we ran the script. From that point on, it's just a matter of what you see on these slides. I hope. All right, so our problem. I generated a nice 10 gigabyte uh, file containing random sentences, and these random sentences were just the Unix Word file piped out into you know, sentences of varying length. The goal is to determine if they're a palindrome. Now, I'm not worried about writing the most, um, the most efficient palindrome checker because that's what these big data technologies are supposed to do, is allow you to crank through data even if your algorithm isn't perfectly efficient. Because as we all know, refining algorithms is very difficult to make them efficient. However, if you have a nice big beefy data system, sometimes you don't have to worry about that efficiency. Now, as a hardware engineer, that kind of kills the inside because you always want to be efficient with hardware. But with big data systems, sometimes you can be inefficient if that's not your bottleneck. So, to demonstrate that, here's my palindrome code. I lowercase it, I reverse the entire string and check every character. Yes, I understand that it is doing twice as many checks as I need to do. I don't care, because I have a data system. So, we're going to run through this 10 gigabyte file, checking for very inefficient palindromes, and I wrote a nice little uh, functor class. For those of you who do C++, this is a functor. Uh, for those of you who do Java, this is a function class, which defines a call so that it can be treated as a first class. Uh, it's like in um, Python, where you can pass functions around as, as data parameters. This allows you to do the same thing in Java. So that is our example. Let's take a look at the results. Whoops, still going wrong. All right, so four node cluster, Decent amount of memory, 80 cores total, and this is what we were able to do. Without Spark, we found 46,000 palindromes in this giant file, and it took 430 seconds to run through. It was on a single machine, single node, and the file was just sitting on local disk. I didn't even give it the advantage of the Hadoop cluster. I just said, you use local disk like everyone else. This is our code. It basically says, read the file, go through it line by line, and check if it's a palindrome. If it's a palindrome, increase the count that we're done. So 
The Spark example found the same number of palindromes. That's good. My code works. Um, the elapsed time is actually 16 seconds, which is amazingly fast compared to this. It was running on three machines, and the file was sitting on the Hadoop cluster, HDFS. In this example, we're not even using the in-memory file system. The file is just an HDFS and is read off of HDFS into Spark. Our code is not much more uh, difficult. It's just a little bit of Java that says Spark read a text file and then Spark run through this, filter through that, that text file and apply our function, check for palindrome. And then increase the count by counting all of the results that pass that filter. And as you can see, there's a very big speed up. Now, what was pointed out to me recently when I did one of these talks is, if you actually do the numbers, we had 80 CPUs, divide this by 80, and you'll get something right near 16. So, what this is showing you is that with the speed up from Apache Spark, you're not losing a lot to overhead. It's almost as if you were perfectly using every CPU on disk without having this manager sticking its head in and taking up resources. So that's pretty cool. We can see that we're getting a very large performance increase and it's getting very close to the theoretical maximum increase that we could see. Any questions here before we move on? No? Okay, great. Um, so, this is what I really care about. This is our streaming example. Was the Hadoop cluster on these three nodes or were there separate data nodes for that? The Hadoop cluster and Spark were running on this, the nodes all together, along with Mesos and the Apache ODT demons. They were all running on the exact same machines. So there weren't extra machines out there squirreling data away or giving the extra performance. Go ahead. When you went from one machine to three machines, same specs for all three? Yes. So that single machine that you saw on the last slide, it was one of my cluster machines with these cluster technologies just powered down. So it was just the machine and its CPUs. So it had plenty of memory. And if you're worried about file caching, I ran through the program twice to force the file into Linux uh, cached memory if the file was small enough to be in there. So I took every precaution to make sure that the operating system was running as efficient as possible and that these other programs were running efficiently as possible. Go ahead. So the only thing different was the first example you were reading as a file, the other one was reading as a screen. You didn't no. use the in-memory in memory file so system. I'm not using the in-memory file system, but I'm using the in-memory processing. So the difference between this and this is not so much the file reading, one's using Hadoop, one's using local disks, but I don't expect a huge speed up there. The difference really is, in this one I'm using Spark. So it's taking that file and cutting it into lots of pieces and saying, ship those pieces to the nodes and process them all at the same time. Where this guy is just saying, I'm gonna be naive and go line by line by line by line and quickly check them all. And I think this is about as fast as you can read through this file and do this check with just a sequential approach. So in order to get more speed out of this without doing some really crazy block reads or something, uh, you've got to parallelize. Another question? So for, for to understand the power of this part thing, you are running only once through the file, right? You are not doing several, you, you have the code there, but uh, just to be sure. You are just going once through the lines of the file. You are not going several times. Yeah, it's probably a little hard to read this code from all the way in the back. Yes, it's just a single open up the file, scan through every line, and then close the file. Go ahead. How many users use the Spark now, or the uh, streaming? So Spark is being used all over industry these days to process through customer records, Facebook click streams, all these things that are generating massive amounts of data that they want to see near real time results on, they're running on something like Spark or Hadoop. Spark being faster, but also having the requirement of you need some memory on your machines and they can't just be old discarded uh, PCs. But not regular users like us. Uh, for, for what do you Spark and stream? So, for regular users like you, there are a couple of companies that produce Spark clusters for you to use. The biggest one, I think, is called Databricks. I don't know much about them other than that they're like Red Hat. They produce a wrapped up solution using Apache Spark. 
Now, in the scientific communities, Spark hasn't penetrated quite as far because we're still in the stage of saying, this is kind of a new untested technology, we've got to treat it with care. Hence me being employed. My job is to prototype with Spark and get it in the user's hands, showing them that it can be safe to do so. Go ahead. Is it, is it true that it would also be more expensive, but it would need more memory on your... So, more expensive than a Hadoop cluster? Yes, because Hadoop doesn't require as much memory, so it can run on lower end commodity hardware. If you want to compare Spark to your standard batch processing machines that we see in the scientific field, it's going to be about the same price because the batch processing machines we have in the scientific field have to have a lot of memory because users do things like this, read a 10 gigabyte file into memory. That's how they program. So in the business, we tend to buy very high-end machines. Spark just needs memory. The machines don't have to be high-end redundant anything because if a machine goes down, it just switches to the next one. So you may actually save money depending on your needs by switching to Spark from the traditional approach. Now Hadoop will still most likely be cheaper because you don't require the same amount of RAM on your system, but it will be considerably slower. For those actual comparisons, you can go to the Spark website. They say that Spark is a thousand times faster than Hadoop. Uh, that's for some use cases. It's probably not for every use case, but it's worth looking into uh, the, their own metrics between Spark and Hadoop because I don't have them in this presentation today. Did you have a question? Yeah, it seems like it's an expensive solution because now you're requiring multiple machines as opposed to one single machine. Did you mean multiple CPUs or? Machines. So we have three machines, each with 80 CPUs, oh. or something like that. I would have to look up the exact uh, specifications of the machines we're running on. <clears throat> but, like I said, it's not necessarily a more expensive solution because you can use commodity hardware for this. Now in this example, I just took the same data nodes and did it three times. So I wasn't using specific commodity hardware, but Spark doesn't care if you have a RAID disk. Spark doesn't care if you have the latest error correcting RAM. Spark doesn't care if you're, you, you have 120 gigabytes of RAM per node. It just needs relatively high RAM for the size of the node. So my laptop, my work laptop, which has 16 gigabytes of RAM, relatively standard, could be happy running Spark for, I'd say, two, maybe three nodes, because that's still four gigabytes per node. My laptop is much cheaper than the kind of mainframes that we're batch processing on, which can cost like hundreds of thousands of dollars for a machine, because they've got 250 gigs of RAM, 80 CPUs, you know, double redundant RAID systems to store your data. So these things, Hadoop, Spark, they're all designed to say, we can lower the cost by using really cheap stuff and just using, you know, double. Like, have two laptops instead of one, make them really cheap components. If one fails, hey, it's all backed up on the other one. Whereas these higher end machines are saying, no, we've got to raid our disks and make sure that this machine never goes down. But having worked in the field, the machines always crash for some reason or another. So Spark is looking nice just for uptime resiliency because a machine is bound to crash when you least want it. But if you have 50 machines instead of one, 49 of them will still keep running. Anyway, um, if you want to have a further discussion about economics, we can talk later. I don't have firm facts on that because this isn't a presentation about economics, but I'm happy to discuss with it uh, afterwards. So can we move on or do you guys have more questions? Great. All right, so streaming. This is the streaming code. Basically, you're opening up a stream that, in this case, is a host in a port. I'm streaming off a network, and you're running it. Now, let's see. All right. So I'm filtering that stream based on the palindromes, and I'm counting the results. These three lines is how much it took to convert my code from processing files to processing streams. It's this three. That's it. All this other stuff is just outputting. So I wanted to print it to a file so I could actually see the results of my stream processing rather than just having it become another stream that feeds back into the data system. So in order to print it out, I had to create a for each call that says, you know, count the results or collect the results, print the item. It's kind of a bear because I have to open up files and write to files and all of that. 
But the actual processing for that palindrome example is just these lines. Everything else is just so you guys can see it. So as you can see, stream processing is actually relatively easy to implement, and we can suddenly process on something much more powerful than just a file. So let's talk about the data that we're piping into this. It's the exact same stuff that I used to generate that 10 gigabyte file, but this time instead of being piped to a file on disk, it's going through netcat and out onto the internet, or out onto my network, where it's being read in by this code and tested uh, real time for palindromes. So let's take a look at this thing and see if we can get it to run. All right, so while this is going to be hard to see, Unfortunately, the text is very gray and our projector isn't super bright, so you can't really see it. Um, but uh, I'll talk through it anyway. So this is just the code showing you a Python script piping into Netcat. Um, so that's all it's doing is creating the stream of data. I'm starting the resource manager. This, the code has been installed in this point, but the resource manager is down. So the resource manager is coming online and it's connecting to the Spark cluster. So the resource manager can run Spark locally. That is just like you run when you download Spark from the internet and install it on your laptop. It allows you to run on your local host. Or it has the ability to connect to a Mesos cluster running a Spark installation. That's what I recommend because then you get multi-tenancy and everything else. I just quickly showed you how simple the configuration files were to say, hey, run this job, which was the code you saw on the other screen. Unfortunately, we couldn't really see it. Now you're seeing the jobs actually blocking data. So all those log files are talking about, hey, we're seeing data come in. Let's chunk this up and send it here. Let's chunk this up, send it here. Let's chunk this up, send it here. And now this on this screen, we are tailing the output file. That's the one we were printing in the previous uh, slide so we can see our results. And I know you're really going to struggle to see them, but you're seeing actually palindromes are being detected as we run down here. Um, so I will give this video to James and he will put it up so that you guys can see it on YouTube or whatever else. Uh, yeah, go ahead. What, uh, how long did the streaming example take compared to the previous file example? How long did it take for what? To just process the same data. Uh, seconds for the other. So I didn't actually test that data uh, because I was streaming directly from my generator which would run forever. So uh, I can... When we get to the question slide, come back to that because I have some things that I've been looking at recently that get into some of the lessons learned around streaming, but uh, we'll get to that in a second. Any other questions on the demo? Otherwise, I'll cut back in and continue. All right, so I hope by this point you're all wondering where can I get this stuff? Well, I gotta say it's open source, so just jump on in. The Apache ODT community is very easygoing. They're incredibly welcoming to anybody who shows up on our lists. And if you commit a patch or two of small bug fixes, you will become a member and a committee member who decides where the project goes in the future. I know because I did that. I committed, I didn't even commit a patch. They just liked the work that they were looking over my shoulder and seeing me do and said, okay, you're in. So go to this uh, SPN, get, get a version of the code, start playing around with it. If you have questions, ask on the mailing list. Whoops, wrong way again. I should also acknowledge some of uh, the people who helped me with this talk. Primarily is the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Through their research and technology development, they are funding this uh, streaming ODT work. They have paid a portion of my salary for the last year so that I could build these very things we're talking about today. It's still a work in progress. That research initiative is still going on, but it's at the point where I can start shipping it out to people like you and saying, take a look. And so we do have the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and NASA to thank for kicking us out the door and getting us started. Also, we need to thank the Apache Software Foundation because they are really good at trying to keep their stuff open source so that the entire world can use it. I'm sure you've all seen the Apache web server, but they have hundreds of projects that you can get in and start working on today. So if you're interested in doing open source, I encourage you to look at the Apache Software Foundation. All right, questions. So, Let's cover your question real quick. You asked if we could process the same amount of data in, um, streaming versus file. So I didn't test that on the palindrome example on my cluster, but the other day I was doing a local test on my Macintosh workstation. And what I was finding is the streaming technology seems to be severely limited by network bandwidth. 
So I could read in a file and pipe it to dev null in like three or four seconds. However, streaming that same file through Netcat and into my system to be processed took something like five minutes because of the network bandwidth limitations. So I'm still looking, I'm still working on a solution because I discovered this problem a couple of days ago. But I will tell you that streaming has to be done with care. Now that being said, I was not using Kafka, and Kafka is supposed to help mitigate some of these problems. So that's the next thing for me to try, is say, hey, is Kafka going to actually help out with this? And so I can tell you that there might be network limitations there. Yeah, go ahead. So you're just doing this across a regular network and not like, say, if you have a cluster, I think they actually no, use faster connections. This, this was on the loopback interface on my Mac. It wasn't even out onto the network. It was entirely inside my local computer, and my local computer's network capabilities could not handle this at the speed I wanted. So the actual thing I was doing is I'm trying to take in a video, run it through standard video conversion, and output a uh, decodec version of the video. So I recorded some stuff off a webcam, put it in a file, piped that file via the network into Spark, did the Spark manipulations to say, okay, convert these pixels, change color spaces, and write it out again, and I was seeing network limitation. Now that being said, on the cluster, where we have full networking capabilities, and we have Kafka running, I'm hoping not to see that, but I haven't gotten to that test yet. So that's one very important lesson learned is you've got to be careful of the bottlenecks that still exist in the system. So if you're using a very slow network interface, that's a bottleneck and it will come back to bite you if you're not careful. All right, you had a question? Uh, I forgot. Okay, but any? I, why is there only five languages? Uh, <laughs> Does that represent your sentence? No, this is just my question slide. <laughs> And when I was making this slide months ago, I got bored, so I put multiple languages in. It's also, I found at JPL, it's a very good way to encourage questions by putting multiple languages that people don't understand on your question slide, because then they have to ask, why are there languages there? And then they're asking questions, and more questions come. So on that note, any other questions? Go ahead. What are some of your other lessons learned on processing large data sets? What are the things to watch out for when you're designing a big data system? So, Broad question. Yes. So I'm trying to. One of the things that we have noticed as we are building these data systems at JPL is uh, what are you going to do with the log files and the other supporting scratch space files of the things you're running? So Hadoop is great, Spark is great, uh, Kafka is great. But they all produce these extraneous scratch files that they don't store in their own distributed system because, hey, why would you? They're scratch files. They're designed to be transient. However, we have noticed that those scratch files themselves can cause bottlenecks for reading and writing to local disk. So that's one thing to be very careful of is what is the network topography and what systems and system components are writing to your local disks that might slow you down even if the technology could go faster. That being said, the big one that the fellow engineers at JPL have flagged is Zookeeper. So Zookeeper we didn't talk about in this presentation because this technology isn't advanced enough to need Zookeeper yet. But Zookeeper says, okay, I'm running Kafka. Kafka has a head node, but what if that head node goes down? Well, well, let's have three or four head nodes out there, and I will manage the voting process of who becomes the next leader, and then when that leader gets effectively assassinated, I'll pick the next leader. That's what Zookeeper does. It also tries to keep the states of your leaders in sync, so it's bringing in a lot of log data, writing a lot of log data out to disk, and preparing to ship that log data, basically snapshots, to the next leader if something breaks. All of that log data in and out and snapshotting is really, really uh, disk I.O. intensive. So that's the one that uh, our engineers at JPL have said, this is something we've got to think about. This is a specific bottleneck in our network topology that is something that we need to know about for the future. So if you're looking at doing something big enough to require multiple Zookeeper install uh, installations keeping track of all this stuff, be aware that Zookeeper is keeping track of more data and trying to file it away somewhere which might cause a bottleneck. Um, other lessons learned. Let's see. Before you come back to that, there's another okay. question. Yeah. 
in some other place, I don't want to. So, I had a question about the network since you mentioned it a couple of times. That it, obviously, it can become the, the bottleneck. And so, but what kind of networks are we talking about? One gig, 10 gig? I believe. So the bottleneck I found was on my local Mac. I doubt that's more than a gig, uh, especially seeing as it's a loopback interface, so it's going in and out of the same network. You cut your traffic in half. I guess it's operating effectively at, at most a gig. Um, the other networks that I'm using, I believe, are 10 gigs, but I would have to go call my SA and say, are these 10 gigs? Because that's what I'm recalling, but I don't have the list of specs on me today. So. The other thing to note about networks is as you get more clients and get more distributed, the um, less you have to worry about certain network bottlenecks. Because the clients for Hadoop, the clients for Spark, the clients for all of these pieces are designed to operate on the, on the network topology. So they're trying to reduce the amount of reads and writes they do over the network. So if data is effectively a better used on this node, they will ship the data to that node and try to localize it, therefore reducing your network bandwidth. So they ship the data to that node or do they ship the question to that node? Both. So Spark actually ships the question, that is the algorithm you're running, and the data to the node. Hadoop tries to localize the data to the node, and I believe if you're using Hadoop MapReduce, which is not a technology I've played with because I stepped right into Spark, I think they try to ship the algorithm to the node as well, but Spark packages them both up in one unit and ships that, and I don't know if Hadoop actually uses one unit or just has two things that are shipped. Any other questions? Go ahead. So given JPL is a bit wary of using open source, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sure there is some sort of a requirement as to how much of a benefit that you're going to get by utilizing all that. In yeah. my mind, it is more expensive if, okay, let's just assume it's the same cost, mm -hmm. right? And your example was maybe 20 times faster, mm -hmm. right? Uh, what is JPL asking for? What is the requirement? before they cut over from their current environment to the new. So I can't speak to the specifics of when or how JPL will adopt these sorts of technologies because honestly that's a discussion that we're having internal to JPL and I just can't report information on a decision that hasn't yet been made. Was I, there any commercialized version that was an alternative to this uh, so, there is the data blocks, which is a commercial alternative. They set up one of these clusters, and where we have open sourced and scripted the, the cluster management, and in effect simplified it a little bit so you have less to worry about. Data blocks, they didn't say, hey, let's package it up and try to make it shippable and runnable out of a package, you know, work out of the box. They say, we're going to apply our own engineers to solve your problem, and you just pay us. So they're one of these platform as a service type folks. Uh, we're trying to take the other approach and just simplify the configuration for you so that you can step right into the problem and then as your needs advance and as your knowledge grows from using this technology, you can set more advanced configuration to run your own cluster. So we're trying to give you the, you know, the training wheels approach to Apache Spark, whereas Databricks is just saying, ship us uh, your problem and we'll solve it for you. But of course they require a lot of money and this is open source. Um, which is best for your company or your solution, that's something that you'd have to research yourself. Any other questions? Go ahead. You talked a little bit about the data transform problem, bringing data in and sending it out to your clients. Mm -hmm. Is that open source? Is there a standard description for this kind of thing? So OODT handles the push and pull aspects of our problems. And so most of the time, when you're using this data system, your goal for getting data out to your clients is basically building a nice web interface that connects with our pre-built web interface that allows you to download data products and stuff. Uh, as for streaming products, we have not quite, uh, we haven't had any customers request data uh, streaming products yet because, well, we're trying to be in front of the curve, so none of the scientists that would normally consume our products are ready for data streams. So we're still proposing ideas to solve that problem, but the operating theory right now is that scientists like certain amounts of data and they want to keep those forever, and the streaming part is just the noise. 
So our goal is to engineer a solution that runs and processes all these streams, and then when you've got a stream that represents results, things that people want, those get piped into a file and stored like normal files, because that's what scientists know how to use, that's what they can reference in their reports, and files are permanent, whereas Kafka will eventually discard your stuff, those files will sit there as long as you remember to keep space for them. So that's our approach today on how we're going to get our streaming products into the hands of people's into people's hands who are not ready to just receive a, a stream directly. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Is it like the you, you, you imagine you're going to find that data structure ahead of time, or are you going to have to the client the ability to request new data structures? So that's a per that's a per problem. That depends on what your use case is. So OODT is designed that it doesn't care what the structure of your data is because it's used all over from medical data, which is just all manner of messy, uh, at least according to the people who I've worked with who have told me that medical data doesn't really come in a nice, easy package. And then we also use it for very regimented science data. So we can't predefine what your data should look like because our job is, to, OODT was designed as a framework. So our job is to give you a framework, and then as you implement your solution, you define these things. So moving forward, we're going to continue the same approach. We'll give you the muscle, and you define these specific configurations to say, my data should look like this, my data should look like this, this algorithm subsets my data and says it to a file. Does that help? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. So I'm interested in your infrastructure. You have a lot of these technologies running on your cluster, who's responsible for deploying it to your cluster? Are you taking a DevOps approach or is it the SA who so, takes care of that? This stuff was designed to be more of a DevOps approach. Our SA set up the cluster and installed two or three basic packages that we needed to build the Mizos installation. After that, he handed me this bare cluster that was metal and said, go for it. So I wrote the, some scripts that you press go and it installs into user space, runs out of user space, and everything is fine. The one trick you have to do is make sure that the things that are storing Hadoop are stored on temp or local and not in your home directory, which is usually NFS mounted, because that defeats everything we're trying to accomplish. So this stuff is... Why do you know that? <laughs> Why do I know that? Because I've worked on a project that heavily used NFS, and we found that processing in NFS for any reason is a bad idea. So I actually knew that before I started playing with Apache Spark, and I got to Apache Spark and I said, hmm, Hadoop uh, cache files should not be stored to NFS, they should be stored to local disk. Um, so this technology, apart from making sure you have a few basic libraries installed, is designed to run out of user space just like OODT can run out of user space. And that being said, you could get an SA to deploy all of this as much as you'd like, but uh, I'm always the DevOps kind of guy, because as I'm developing, I'm also uh, twiddling settings, and I don't like to call it the SA every 10 minutes. Any other questions? Let's thank Michael.